weeks, and I'm about to tell you, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. I, I had to pinch myself. I, I get to come back, and, and in my profession, this week I get to study the Word of God. <laughs> That's a pretty cool job. And to be with the church family, thank you for being here. My privilege to be back. You know, a couple of years back, we did a series on the book of Proverbs. Proverbs was written by a very wise man named Solomon, the wisest of the wise. And one proverb that I didn't get a chance to preach on, but I think has a wealth of wisdom, is this one. Here it comes up. As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. Which is to say that when you and I consider our hearts, we think that those things in there are hidden, right? They're secrets. No one knows but us. We know our hearts and desires. But what this proverb is saying, that though you and I think they're hidden, they come out. The desires, what we keep hidden in there, will be seen. They will be seen in the people that we are and the decisions that we make. I think this past week we saw this proverb come true with one Illinois politician or a former Illinois politician. Maybe you heard that uh, Rod Blagojevich convicted, right? Read the news. And if you remember when he was convicted, he, he tried to play it off that, that he was he was good on the outside, right? So he went on Letterman, and we saw him on Celebrity Apprentice, I think, and, and there he was trying to convince many people that you know I'm a good guy. And yet the desires of his heart, which here was greed trying to sell the Senate seat, they came out. That greed led to action and he was exposed and convicted. How many people have we seen lately that are like God Blagojevich? That it starts with an evil desire in the heart, it leads to an evil action, and then they're exposed and convicted. Who can you pick up? Well, unfortunately more politicians than Arnold Schwarzenegger maybe. Uh, Anthony Weiner, um, Elliot Spitzer, um, John Edwards. I mean, there's a whole list again where, where you know, they, they try to look good on the outside, the desires of their heart led to an action and finally exposed. And here's the thing that you and me, I need to consider this morning. I, I want you to very be introspective. What is in your heart? What are those desires? Because though you may not think about it, they will see the light of day. They might lead to actions, and then people will see exactly what is in that heart. Maybe you are a little reserved and uncomfortable about all the things that are in our hearts. If you feel that way, you're in good company. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at a great example. We're going to take a look at it at a heart that pleases God. The type of heart that He wants. And here we turn to King David. Now I'm excited to get into this series because David is an awesome biblical figure. I mean, talk about a warrior. Talk about a man of God. Talk about a worshiper. He wrote most of the Psalms. And about David, he, he's probably one of the most prominent figures besides Jesus in the Bible. Uh, about the chapters dedicated to his life, a man named Abraham has 14 chapters dedicated to his life. Maybe you heard of Joseph. He has 14 chapters. Maybe you heard of Elijah, he's got 10 chapters, and Jacob's got 11. You don't want to know how many chapters are dedicated to David's life? 66. 66. So what this means is that I'm going to be preaching for about four hours today. Hopefully you have some food, and, and we're going to wrap this series up about a year later. Everyone's on board? Just kidding. That was the way up here. But no, this is some awesome, awesome information from a man, David, that, that there's so many life lessons we can learn. And what, what, what is David's trump card? The one thing we can draw away is his We can learn from David about a heart that pleases God. Now before I get into the story, David, if it's okay, I'm going to set up the larger story. I'm going to set up the context for today. And the nation of Israel, the bigger context, that nation... They had heart problems. And this was seen in the type of government that they wanted. Now before King David, there was a king named Saul. And before that, their system of government was known as a theocracy. Anyone know what a theocracy is? Or theo? 
It means God is your government. <laughs> and how cool would that be? Have God as, as the, the man in charge. Think about how wise his decisions. How powerful his protection is. Commander in chief. Can you imagine if you went to the presidential voting ballot next, next time we vote and, and there was Obama, Romney, God. Tough choice, right? What am I going to choose? But here's the thing. The Israelites didn't like it. The Israelites, they, they were fed up with this. They wanted a king. And Samuel, the prophet of God at this time, warns him, no, you don't want a king. A king is going to take your best sons and your best daughters, and he's going to make soldiers out of the sons and slaves and servants out of your daughters. That's going to be way too harsh. But the people, here was their response when Samuel warned them. They said, no, no. See, we want a king over us. And here we see their heart. Then we'll be like all the other nations. We'll be normal. We don't want to be special. We want to be normal. And we'll look good. With a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. Imagine God hearing their response. Because before he was leading them, and he was going before them in their battles. They say, no, we don't, want to, we don't want that. We want to look good on the outside. Let, let's be like everyone else and have a king. And they got what they demanded. The first king was named Saul. And just as the people wanted, he looked good on the outside. He was tall and handsome. He looked kingly. But here was the myth that they believed about Saul, about having a king. And it's a myth that I think you and I tend to believe. That if it looks good on the outside, well, then it must be good on the inside. I think this is why we're, we're kind of shocked when those with high profiles get in trouble. Because we give some credence to this. That if you look good on the outside, well, on the inside, that's shocking. Find a tiger, find an armor. And they would find this with Saul, and this was a myth. Because Saul, he did look good on the outside, he did good for a while. But the inside was evil. He disobeyed and rejected the Lord's will. And after this, the Lord rejected him as king. And it's in this context of Saul being rejected as king that we pick up our lesson for today. It's in this context that, that there needs to be a new king that, that we read from the Word of God today. I invite you now to follow along 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicated. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw a lion and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but, you know, he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. 
He was ruddy, with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David and Paul. Samuel then went to God. The word of our God. As we read this story, as we hear it, I think it is striking that the prophet of God, Samuel, he bought into this myth. And we see that when David's first eldest son, Eliab, comes by. Eliab walks by, and he probably walks like he owns the place, tall, dark, and handsome, the highest and strongest. And Samuel looks at him and says, yeah, that's a king. Look at those muscles, look at those features. Yeah, this must be the Lord's anointed. But the Lord was going to teach Samuel something about outward appearances. The Lord was about to teach that, that he cares about the heart. Dear friends in Christ, friends in amazing love, how much are we influenced by outward appearances? If we're true to ourselves, if we're being honest, it's quite a bit, isn't it? That's our society. Over vacation, my wife and I had a chance to go out into Miami, and that was our getaway away from the kids. It was good to be away from the kids a little bit, just husband and wife. I recommend it if you get a chance. And while we were downtown Miami, I saw the, the most awesome cars in a row, one after another. It was like Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini, one after another, after another. And, and I'm a car guy, so my head was spinning. And I was impressed. I'm like, sorry, honey, I got it. I mean, that's, did you see that car? I mean, that's, that's awesome. I was definitely swayed by the outward appearance of those cars. Now, now maybe you're not a car person, but maybe you're in, you're in the fashion. Your thing is fashion. And so you walk into church, and you know when someone's got new shoes, right? Those are good shoes. You know when someone's got a new outfit on, the Christmas, the Christmas of a new shirt, or a new hairdo. You see, you know this. For some in our area, I think it's landscaping. I'm not into this, but I guess there are some. Uh, those are good shrubs. That's awesome. Maybe it's not you either. Okay. But we are affected by the, the outward appearance of things, aren't we? We're a nation where people fixated on those things. And it's because of this that I think we're even tempted to live as if the myth were true. That's how we're tempted to live. If I just look good on the outside, it doesn't matter what's on the inside. And so you're a student. You're a student, and, and as long as I make the grade, and I get A's, and, and the teacher likes me, it doesn't matter how much work I put into it, right? It doesn't matter where I got the information. It doesn't matter how I study. Tempted to do this at work. As long as the boss likes me, and I say the right things in the meetings, and the sales report looks good on paper, it doesn't matter what I do when the boss isn't looking, or when he's away, or what I say about him, or her. And I think this is especially a strong temptation to do as Christians. Right? As long as I do what's good on the outside, I, I go to church, throw something in the basket, Sing the songs or nod my head. Doesn't matter what's on the inside, right? But the Lord says, no. No way. God's telling us today, your heart matters. It's essential. While everyone else might look at the outside, I see your heart. I see those desires. And that's essential. And the worst thing that can happen if our hearts aren't clean and right, the worst thing that can happen is not that we're exposed for doing a bad deed, that, that we do something wrong. That's not the worst. The worst if our hearts aren't right is that we could be kept out of the kingdom of God. And that we could lose a relationship with Jesus forever. So what are we to do? awesome thing about our God and the awesome thing about grace. You see, grace isn't about what we have to do. It's 
It's about what He has done for us. And what our God has done for us is He's taken out our stony, sinful hearts and He's given us new ones. And this happened as, at our anointing. Yes, we have been anointed, just as David was. Now, it wasn't by the prophet Samuel, and thank goodness he didn't use olive oil. But when were we anointed? When a pastor or a family member went to the font. Through the water and the word, changed our hearts. He gave us new ones. When through faith, we became children of God. Dear friends, we have new hearts through baptism, through our life, through the grace of God. God has solved that problem for us. And now as Samuel looks for a king, that is what he's looking for. He's looking for a man of faith. A man who's got one of those new hearts. A heart given by the Lord. And so if we pick up our story, we see all the, the sons of Jesse walk by. And Samuel's a little dumbfounded after they walk by. He's like, you know, I'm sorry, but got any more sons? And Jesse can almost hear his response. Yeah, but I, I mean, he's the youngest. Frail little thing. Doesn't know much. Weak. And, and by the way, we left him with the sheep. <laughs> you don't want that scrambling little thing. Samuel says, no, send for him. Get him in here. We're not going to sit down until you do. And then walks in our man. The Bible says ready, which means reddish. And there I think he didn't use suntan and lotion. He's probably beat red watching the sheep. Doesn't look so good. Probably snot nosed and shorter than the rest. But the Bible does say handsome, so he's got some appearance. Okay. Daniel hears, that's the one. That's the one out of all the sons. That is the one. And what was the reason? The Bible makes it clear. In the book of Acts, we hear this about, about David. But uh, about David, it says, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own life. What's the best part of the One after God's own. Set on God. One that loves his desires over your desires. His will over your will. One that says, no matter what happens, I'm never going to be separated from my God. That is clear. And here God taught an important lesson about outward appearance versus inward heart. And God is so much more concerned about people. And we thank God that Jesus was like this. We thank God that Jesus was concerned more about the inward. It's because Jesus was that he was content to take on the outward appearance of a frail, helpless baby. Though inwardly, he was the king of kings. Because of this, Jesus would take on the appearance of a man, become fully human, though inwardly remaining fully God. Because of this, Jesus was content to bear an outward defeat and outward humiliation as he was beaten and crucified because he knew down to his core that inwardly he was achieving the greatest victory over sin, death, and the devil. Praise be to God that he focuses on the inward rather than the outward. And there's great comfort for us because our God is like this. There is great comfort that God is looking and concerned about our internal rather than our outward. Because I don't know about you, but outwardly, I don't know what I am in the world's eyes. Pastor. Okay. Don't have such a big name. Some might think I'm pretty foolish and silly for preaching the word and being pumped up about Jesus. I'm not sure how, how the world views you. Whether you have a, a good name, a bad name, somewhere in the middle, I'm, I'm not sure. I know I can relate to the verse in Corinthians that says he chose the weak and despised the things that are not, because that's me. And maybe you don't feel that way today, but if it happened at one time in high school, you felt that way. Or maybe you felt looked down upon and you work because you weren't in that high position. But 
down upon because of scholarly achievements. But the comfort of God is this. And to God, you and I, you and I are royalty. Just as David was anointed king, you and I are kings and queens who will inherit the crown of eternal life. That because of Jesus, he sees you as his power, his strength, him working in you. That because of Jesus, he sees someone who is just awesome, loved by him, and accepted. What awesome comfort that God is concerned just with you, anyone, and not so much with God. And dear friends, let us continue to pursue a heart like David. A heart that is set on God and His will. To close, I'm going to real briefly talk about two characteristics that David had that I think we should pursue. Those characteristics are humility and integrity. David shows both of those characteristics by what he does next. Some of you don't know what happens what he does next. Let me tell you what David doesn't do after he's anointed. David, after he's anointed king, he doesn't go before his brothers and say, Booyah! Look at me! You guys don't tend to sheep. Eat it! I'm king! Yeah! No, David doesn't say those words. Nor, nor does he go to the blacksmith getting fit for a crown. Who maybe just decides? No, no, David does. He goes back to tending the sheep. He just found out he's king and he goes back with the sheep. He does what he knows to do and knows what he should be doing. That's humility. That's humility. Seeing himself in God's eyes. I was thinking of, of how you and I can pursue humility. How do you pursue humility? I had some ideas. Maybe we could all sing karaoke. You know, that's embarrassing for quite a few of us. Maybe we could, you know, uh, if you watch the hot dog eating contest in New York, Nathan's hot dog eating contest, maybe we should sign up for that. If one of us not do so well. And, I don't know. That'd be embarrassing. But more than getting embarrassed, you want to know how I think we pursue humility at its best? We do what David is praised for. We increasingly set our hearts on God. That's it. Because when you do this, you know what happens? When you set your heart on God and you see yourself as God sees you, you realize that you can't be full of pride. Because if you're tempted to be prideful, you have to remember, okay, God made me. He gave me all my talents and abilities. And he gave me all the possessions that I currently own as gifts of his grace. How can I be proud of those things? If we set our hearts on God, we have to remember that if it were up to us, we are complete and utter miserable failures spiritually. Because of sin. And if it were not for his grace, we cast aside. And yet God loves us so much that he built us up. He called us his own. He has forgiven our sins and he loves us. When we see ourselves as God sees us, we have humility. Another character trait to, to pursue, I think, is integrity. Integrity is not seen by all the companies of America. I think, I think Bank of America just had to pay back some money for some bad mortgages. Think of an Enron who was exposed for looking good on the outside but not so good on the inside. You read the news you hear a country like Greece, who when they entered the European Union, they, they tried to make everything look good, but now we found out about internal corruption and, and, and that's not so good. Integrity is doing what you know is right when no one is looking. Integrity is who you are when no one is looking and you don't know you'll get praised for it in doing the right thing. That's our mandate. Didn't get a lot of praise for tending the sheep, but went back and did what was right. Dear friends, what are you doing when no one is looking? I think that's a good litmus test for where your heart is. How much you set on God. Pursue the things of God. Because God sees that. And sooner or later, those around us will see it. They'll lead to action. People will pursue.
pursue integrity and humility. And though sometimes we might do evil, and we might get exposed for it, David's going to be exposed for evil things, when your heart is set on God, you will remain stable. For you remember the peace and forgiveness of His love, of mercies that are in every morning. May God give you a heart set on Amen. Please stand.